A terror strike that's planned with military precision. This is perhaps the closest that comes to an attack which is short of war. Ten men paralyze a city of 19 million. We were absolutely numb. Everything seemed to be exploding. A definitive account of a 60-hour siege that takes India's largest city by storm. A rubber dinghy approaches Mumbai's southern shoreline. Ahead, the fisherman's colony is unusually deserted. Almost everyone is home watching an India-England cricket match. One man is an exception. Out for a smoke after dinner, Bharat Tandale sees something curious. Ten well-dressed young men in a rubber dinghy pull up to the jetty. Two men remain in the boat and head out towards another part of the city. Tandale doesn't report the encounter until it's too late. Eight men move towards the main road. It's another night in the city, but that will soon change. About a kilometer north of the jetty where the eight men have come ashore is the famous Taj Mahal Palace and Tower Hotel. A heritage five-star property, it's played host to kings, presidents, CEOs and rock stars for over a century. Taj guest John Fesco is in Mumbai on business. He's taking the night off to show his girlfriend Dara Huang around. It's the first time here and she's excited to get a chance to explore the city. The American couple sees an inviting cafe and walks in for a drink. Your so it was very crowded. Uh, we passed by and we were thirsty, so we sat down um, and we ordered uh, some juice. And then we sort of realized that most of the people there were foreigners. Uh, it was almost all tourists in there. Two men with rucksacks approach the cafe. No one spares them a second glance. John and Dara have no idea that the two men outside are about to change their lives forever. I remember thinking that uh, it, it, it's a bomb. That was my first reaction. And then everything seemed to be exploding. So I wanted to get onto the ground, but we didn't. We didn't die, and I realized uh, then that it wasn't a bomb that somebody was shooting into the cafe. And then I remember screaming for her to get down. Luckily, we ended up in front of this column, this concrete column. Uh, the glass was on the floor, and somebody's uh, blood splattered on me. We, we didn't even know there were two shooters. And then there was a lull, and uh, uh, Dara bolted out of the restaurant down the street, and I ran after her. The couple run through the streets of Kolaba looking for a safe haven. They don't know yet, but they are headed to the same place the gunmen are, the Taj Hotel. Nobody there knew what was going on. Nobody had seen anything. Yet. And. Uh, and then suddenly we heard more gunfire. 
At about the same time the two gunmen opened fire at the Taj Hotel and the cafe, another landmark of Mumbai city is about to be assaulted. At the Chhatrapati Shivaji terminus, two men with rucksacks get out of a cab and enter the train station. The driver doesn't know they've left a deadly package behind. It's a bomb that's set to explode in an hour's time. Almost three and a half million people pass through this station every day. The platforms are overcrowded this evening. The two men walk towards a washroom. Fonjan Fernandez runs a food stall just a few meters away. I found bullets flying all over. People were all running helter skelter from down below on the floor, on the ground floor. They fired mercilessly. People were murdered uh, in cold blood. Constable Jilu Yadav is on duty on the other side of the station. He hears gunfire and rushes over. When I came here, I saw that there was a plate farm in the four numbers and he was sitting in his magazine. So I told him what he was looking at and he killed him. So he didn't fire. So I came to him and I took his rifle and I fired him. After fire, he was looking at me and he was looking at me and he was looking at me. So I was looking at him and I was looking at him and I was looking at him. Armed with antiquated rifles, the railway police miss their targets. The gunmen leave behind 58 dead and 108 wounded. Twenty-five-year-old Nafisa Qureshi and her family had just missed their train. I we're now breaking this news. This is a terror attack. This has all the makings of a terror attack on Mumbai. Let me cross over to Rohit Chanda Varkar. Anubhav, we, are, we can confirm now that police are saying that this is... With at least three locations in South Mumbai under attack, television networks are reporting live. Only after 20 minutes of breaking the story, that channel sort of began to realize past 10 that it was a terrorist attack. It took 15, 20 minutes for that realization to come in. And if you look at that time, that's also the time when the police was waiting for the confirmation. The firing at the Taj Mahal Hotel grabs headlines. There are about a thousand guests within the walls. On the sixth floor of the Heritage Wing, 69-year-old banker K. R. Ramamurthy is restless. All he knows is that the hotel is under fire. Ramamurthy calls home to tell his family he's safe, but he's not so sure. Someone's at the door. Within seconds, there are gunshots. He runs into his washroom, but before he can lock it, two men break open the door. Ramamurthy is taken hostage. Over the next two hours, he watches as the gunmen turn his room into their command center. Joint Commissioner Rakesh Maria has 27 years on the police force and heads Mumbai's crime branch. 
The chief has put him in charge of the control room. From around 21.45 hours to 0, 0, 0 hours, I think uh, we got close to around uh, 7,000 calls. I am talking of calls only relating to terrorists. The terrorists noted here, a suspected person there, a motor vehicle or a motorcycle laden with explosives there. So control room's job was to send and dispatch forces to all these locations, seven to eight calls per minute. Reports flood in. The taxi that left the train station an hour ago blows to bits near the airport, killing the driver and a passenger. Another cab explodes at the docks, killing three and leaving 19 injured. A bomb goes off at a petrol pump near Leopold Cafe. The Oberoi Trident, a five-star hotel, and Nariman House, a Jewish center, are also under attack. Maria's colleague, Vishwas Nangre Patil, has managed to enter the Taj with Sunil Kudyadi, the head of hotel security. All Patil has is a service pistol. Sunil Kudyadi showed me three men, young men, going, going towards the third floor. He showed me, sir, they are there and without losing a fraction of a second, I, 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 in an instant reaction, shot three shots. Three shots from a Glock pistol towards them. And um, unfortunately, for a, uh, for, a, for a fraction of a second, I thought that as if they are with haversacks, maybe tourists. So I retracted back and that time, a volley of bullets busted towards us. Again, I saw from the wall side, uh, took, uh, within a moment, I uh, took a side towards that staircase, but they had vanished. Patil spends the next hour looking for them on the sixth floor of the north wing, while the gunmen are on the fifth floor of the south wing. While the Taj siege continues, the two gunmen from the train station exit through a walkway. On the prowl, looking to lay siege to a new target. Over the next 30 minutes, various officers radio sightings of the gunmen to the control room, but no one manages to engage them. Suddenly, there's a new target. A few minutes away from the Chhatrapati Shivaji terminus, the Kama and All Bless Hospital. At that moment, one didn't know how many of them were there, where, who they were, what weaponry they had. We, we you know, we just knew something was happening at uh, Kama. Maria's counterpart in the state anti-terror squad is Hemant Karkare. He rushes to the rear entrance of the Kama hospital. Armed with carbines and service pistols, eight policemen are in a fierce gun battle inside. But they're severely injured, in need of backup. There was force there. And, um, you know, Mr. Karkare spoke uh, at about 23.58. And, uh, you know, they were planning to enter Kama. The gunmen keep the police at bay outgunning them with their AK-47s and hand grenades. The hand grenades is what made the difference because the moment they encountered any obstruction or you know they were not allowed to come out from a certain location, they lobbed uh, hand grenades. The rear gate is secure, but the gunmen could slip out from the other exit in the front. Karkare asks the control room for reinforcements, but he doesn't wait. Two of the city's brightest cops are with him. Additional Commissioner Ashok Kamte and Inspector Vijay Salaskar. Armed with AK-47s, the three men jump into a police car and head for the front entrance of the hospital. It will prove to be a costly mistake. Unknown to them, 
the gunmen have already left the complex. Karkare and his team are heading right for them. A witness watches from a 14th floor window. I heard a car coming from this way, like suddenly stopped. So by, as I heard the sound, I went onto the window to see what actually happened. I saw the terrorist firing at the car and there was a counter attack from the people in the car also. But like they couldn't survive and this lasted for about some 15 to 20 seconds. They both came near the car, they took out the bodies, they sat in the car and they just zoomed off. When the information came that uh, three of them are dead, you know, the, 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 we, were, we were absolutely numb. Three of the city's brightest officers are dead. An unknown number of gunmen are at large, armed, deadly, and intent on killing. And the police have no idea where they'll strike next. Chaotic firing, grenade blasts and bombs at multiple locations have rocked Mumbai for the past three hours. Apprehension grips the city. A police van comes out of the alley near Kama Hospital. No one knows that inside are the two gunmen who have just killed three of the city's finest cops. TV crews capture the moment when the gunmen opened fire. Two people are killed, including a policeman in plain clothes. That is a police car being hijacked by the perpetrators of this gun battle. Uh, this is the biggest fear. Just ahead, officers are checking cars for signs of terrorists. Sanjay Govilkar had left for the day, but he returns to join his colleagues in the line of duty. Wireless message पे हमें लगातार ये message मिल रहे थे कि ताज ओबेर रहा है, VT में firing हो रही है, वहाँ पे काफी tense माहौल था. The police control room alert the officers that the gunmen have ditched the police van, switched to a silver sedan, and are now heading north. At night, the car was the Immediately, we were chilling, so they started to wipe the wiper on the windscreen. And the wiper was not showing anything inside. So, as we were chilling, we started to go a little further. Immediately, they tried to take the car right turn. But unfortunately, the car stopped on the divider. There were two teams. One police team armed with pistols moves towards the right of the car. Govilkar, who is unarmed, stays to the left. One terrorist dies in the shootout. The other looks injured. Officer Tukaram Omle, armed with a baton, reaches for the injured gunman. 
और जैसे ही उन्होंने किया तो हम लोग सब लोग उनके साथ ही थे पर बोलते हैं ना कोई आगे बढ़ने पे फिर एक हौसला हो जाता है तो उनकी बहादुरी की तो नो डाउट इवन इन डेथ ओबले डज नॉट रिलीज हिज ग्रिप थ्री आवर्स आफ्टर दी अटैक ऑन द कैफे मुंबई पुलिस फाइनली कैप्चर्स वन ऑफ द टेरिस्ट हिज नेम मोहम्मद अजमल आमिर कसम the moment ismail was killed and kasab was arrested there, there i think that was a turning point whatever you know the men felt due to the loss of these three officers i think uh, the incident at vinoli chopati i think it boosted the morale and said that we could despite them having hand grenades and ak's we could uh, get the better of them in days to come Kasab the only man they capture alive will tell Maria and his team of investigators the story of how 10 men laid siege to a city of 19 million In the control room Maria demands for the National Security Guard's elite anti-terror commando unit but he'll have to wait till daybreak for the commandos to travel from their base near Delhi over 1400 kilometers north of Mumbai At around 1 in the morning the control room receives a chilling message an indian intelligence agency has intercepted the gunman's cell phones aur is tarike se jo hai na bahut sare log zakhmi hai mare gaye mare gaye aur takriban wo keh rahe hain ki 50 fidai jo hai na wo shehar pure mein dakhal hai pure shehar mein sugar firing ho rahi hai the intercepts prove that the what they were watching on tv is what instructions they were giving you know operational instructions motivational instructions sabse jyada aapka jo target hai na ye jo taj hotel isko covering coverage de rahe media the source of the handlers calls can't be traced immediately it will take over a month for the american federal bureau of investigation to track these virtual numbers to locations in pakistan helpless on the floor inside the taj ramamurthy hears snippets of his captors phone conversations the gunmen also bring in four taj staffers as hostages the handlers urge the terrorists to set the hotel on fire they know the dramatic images of the burning taj will grab media attention incredible pictures there and and quickly the events unfolded they had reported the smoke billowing out of of the taj hotel the gunmen also use the fire as a strategic cover to change positions and reload their weapons four floors below raba murti Patil sees terrorists prowling around on the top two floors of the heritage wing on closed circuit TV but he's not sure how many there are on the basis of CCTV uh, footage which is covering only one fourth of the area it was not advisable to get correct figure of the terrorists Patil tracks them till the terrorists notice the cameras and start smashing them he contemplates storming the rooms but he's told by the control room to hold off till the commandos get there security forces have evacuated almost 650 guests at the taj but no one knows how many are still trapped some of those rescued reveal to the media that the gunmen are targeting people with american and british passports John and Dara have found refuge at a ground floor restaurant near the lobby. We heard a couple of, of bombs go off. Uh, then panic sort of really set in and it became more quiet and more nervous. And uh, we were told that military commanders were on their way from Delhi, but then they keep seeming to be delayed. And uh, and so we were just we were just sort of waiting uh, waiting for them to arrive. Suddenly there's a sound of a huge explosion. 
The scariest part was we could hear this, we could hear the fire getting louder and louder. And we kept feeling the walls, they were getting hot. The explosion that John hears is a bomb on the sixth floor. Minutes ago, the terrorists had planted it near Rama Murthy's room. They then took Rama Murthy and four other hostages as human shields down to a room on the fifth floor. For the first time, the terrorists feel threatened by the fire. They abandoned their hostages. This whole floor caught fire. And the smoke started coming inside. The flames started coming inside of the CCTV room. So we took the decision to go out. Even as the Taj is cordoned off by security forces, those trapped inside make desperate attempts to escape. The fire brigade starts battling the blaze. They spot an old man waving out to them from the second floor. Fortunately, with some pressure, I was able to untie myself one hand. Then within 10 minutes, I saw the fire tenders, the searchlight uh, coming. Then I opened the window and shouted for help. So they took me around, uh, helped me, and they said, you are safe enough. Three hours after capturing Kasab, Mumbai police start questioning him. This is the first time they will get an idea of just who they are up against. It was, I think, only around 3.30 in the morning when Kasab was uh, questioned where one realized that uh, there were 10 of uh, them. But again, it was his word against, uh, you know, it was just a pointer, but we couldn't take his word at face value. They were told that this is a Fidaim team. See, coming 592 nautical miles from Karachi to Mumbai, entering into an alien country, opening fire. The instructions were, open indiscriminate fire, kill as many as you can, take hostages, go to a higher location, a vantage location, stay put there, lay siege there, and keep the forces at bay for as long as you can, till you die. This, is, this was the brief given to them. It's been eight hours since John and Dara have been trapped in the Taj Hotel. They still wait to be rescued. Um, at one point, we tried to go out maybe around five or so, uh, and there was a spray of gunfire in the lobby and everyone rushed back into the room and closed the doors and rebarricaded the, the doors. Ten gunmen have paralyzed India's largest city with guns, grenades and bombs. Mumbai desperately waits for counter-terror commandos to come to its rescue. It's the worst hostage crisis in Mumbai's history. At least a hundred people have been killed, including 16 policemen. As few as eight terrorists have captured two luxury hotels and one local Jewish community center in downtown Mumbai. <laughs> set of pictures there of a very determined looking group. This is the, the special, special... Almost 200 commandos from the National Security Guard finally enter a city on its knees. Yeah. 
J.K. Dutt, Director General of the NSG, is ready to take over from the police. They split into three groups and head towards the three places still under attack. But it will take them three more hours to chalk out ground strategies and begin Operation Black Tornado. I had briefed my men that one, we should try and see that the hostages were kept absolutely safe. We had to keep four lateral damage to the minimum and to try and take the terrorists alive as far as possible. At that time, it was not known whether they had any local support or not, whether there was anyone from the area who had joined them. Half the force take on the Taj Hotel. Thirty-one-year-old Major Sandeep Unikrishnan is assigned to the old heritage wing. Almost ten hours after they were trapped in the Taj, the staff get a message from the security forces that they can evacuate guests from the ground floor restaurant. John and Dara are finally out. I realized that it was Thanksgiving. And this is a very big holiday in America. It's about family and, uh, and giving thanks for all the, all the good things you have in life. And uh, I, I started to cry. And uh, it was just this overwhelming sense of relief that, uh, that Daryl was OK, um, that, that, that we made it out OK. But hundreds are still trapped inside. Meanwhile, a couple of kilometers away from the Taj, the commandos have begun to engage the gunmen holed up at the other luxury hotel, the Oberoi Trident. The media reports every minute of the operation as they see it. It is the 28th floor Trident Hotel. Uh, the uh, uh, army commandos have gone, uh, have got up the floor. They're going on a top-down approach. They've come from the 28th floor down to the 21st floor. Nariman House is a Jewish Kabad residence. A young rabbi lives there with his family. They, along with three Jewish guests and two Indian staffers, have been trapped inside for the last 14 hours. But the area is a potential killing field. It's densely built and packed with onlookers who could be caught in the crossfire. Sorry to interrupt you. This is the breaking news. We are trying to get you the first shots. Suddenly, news channels cut to an extraordinary scene. An Indian woman has just run out with the rabbi's two-year-old son. But she doesn't know if anyone else is alive inside. Back at the Taj, it's been over 18 hours since the siege began. Over the last six hours, Sandeep's team has painstakingly cleared the fifth and sixth floors. There are no signs of the gunmen yet. Just as the commandos approach a room on the fourth floor, shots ring out. In the encounter that follows, the gunmen hurl grenades. As the room blazes with fire, the gunmen disappear. Whenever they set fire to a room, and this happened after about two or three such incidents of setting fire, I felt that they were using this time to really rest and recuperate or to rearm themselves or reload their weapons. Since the fourth floor shootout at the Taj, the gunman's trail has gone cold. Major Sandeep Unikrishnan and a team of commandos regroup in the lobby to start afresh. It's been almost 24 hours since the siege began. With people still trapped inside, the commandos try a different approach. They move towards the central staircase. They know they're exposed from all sides, 
but it's a risk they're willing to take. Sandeep, a veteran of counter-terrorist operations in Kashmir, leads fearlessly. It is a risk which he took, a risk which nobody teaches anyone, a risk which I think, I believe, comes out of a rich emotional account, a bank, emotional bank account. Sandeep and his partner make their way up to the first landing. Suddenly, they're ambushed. The NSG suffers its first setback. Major Sandeep Unni Krishnan has been fatally wounded. I learned it from a TV news on 28th morning, somewhere around 9.45, after 9.45, maybe around 10 o'clock. And uh, I hid it for a moment because I could not tell my wife that my son is dead. The commandos have no time to grieve for their fallen comrade. They can't rescue Sandeep's body until morning. The amount of ammunition that these terrorists have is such that it could keep them going till this evening and that's what the NSG is worried about, which is why they are treading very cautiously. 36 hours of live broadcast horrifies the world. It's like 9-11. No one knows who's directing the attack or what is their motive beyond terror. Big news coming out of Nariman House. Three camera positions tell the entire story. NSG commandos were para-dropped under the cover of heavy fire from surrounding buildings. Intelligence agencies reveal the gunmen are guided by handlers watching the news. Within minutes, the Indian government instructs news channels to cut the live feed. You can't tell television channels to come to the scene of the operation of a terror attack, then tell us later on that you were compromising security. If you felt that TV channels were compromising security at these sites, keep us away. Create a system by which we, we get the information on a regular basis. I think that didn't happen. I can't blame the media. The authority should have intervened and told the media that just as the people of India are watching what's going on live on television, the terrorist inside is also able to watch live on television. And his controllers sitting wherever they are sitting are perhaps able to watch it on television. I think the response of the authorities was slow and deficient. By afternoon, the commandos at the Oberoi Trident Hotel have good news. They rescue over 90 people, but 35 have already been killed, among them nine foreigners. At this point, the commandos know that the gunmen have killed all the hostages at Nariman House. They move in for the final assault. The battle lasts all day. That evening, the commandos emerge to reveal that two gunmen have been killed inside. They also recover the bodies of the five Jewish hostages, the rabbi, his wife, and all three of their guests. This entire operation appears to be over. The police is standing by at a distance from them. Over the next few months, analysts will reveal their suspicions that the perpetrators targeted Jews in an attempt to disrupt growing relationships between India and Israel. It's midnight of the third day. Guns have fallen silent at Oberoi and Nariman House. But the lanes around the Taj still resound with gunfire. Snipers from the security forces outside the Taj seem to be targeting windows in the northern wing of the Heritage Hotel. It's been almost 40 hours since Operation Black Tornado began. The commandos managed to corner four gunmen between a bar near the lobby and a restaurant on the first floor. 
The gunmen have no hostages, but they're in no mood to surrender. They take cover behind a spiral staircase and move up and down to confuse the commanders. The NSG thought that there were two groups of terrorists, one uh, on the first floor and another on the ground floor. Inside the restaurant, the gunmen resort to old tactics. They set the place on fire to distract the commanders. We didn't allow these chaps to change the position, otherwise they could have moved to another part of the hotel. After a prolonged gun battle through the night, the commandos brace up for the final assault. They launch grenades from all directions. Suddenly, television crews capture a terrorist falling out of a window. The commandos outside spray him with bullets. But the firing inside continues for another 20 minutes. When the shooting stopped, there was no response to our uh, shots from outside. We went inside and found these uh, two bodies which were lying near the spiral staircase. So two were inside, one was outside. The fourth body we had not found. Once the fire is doused, the commandos will go on to recover the body of the fourth terrorist, buried under the charred remains of the restaurant. All in all, Mumbai police have killed one terrorist and the commandos have killed eight. Operation Black Tornado is over. The Taj is finally declared safe. The 60-hour carnage has killed 166 and injured 304 more. Only one terrorist out of 10 survives. He'll stand trial in an Indian court for crimes some charge are the equivalent of war. In terms of one nation attacking another nation, this is perhaps the closest that comes to an attack which is short of war. The Mumbai terror attack was planned with military precision and exposes the city's systemic fault lines. A state inquiry uncovers critical lapses in how the city was defended. Over eight months, Indian intelligence agencies had fielded no less than six specific alerts signaling a seaborne terror attack on luxury hotels. Yet, the terrorists sail in unimpeded. I think the whole system was not sufficiently responsive and intelligence was not being shared on a real-time basis. And uh, there was no pressure to share intelligence to come to conclusions. The inquiry also reveals the endemic failures of the state government and the Mumbai police. The city had already experienced terrorism, and yet the force lacked ammunition, training, and staff. In the heat of the moment, Senior police officers failed to coordinate their actions and deviated from standard procedures. The most devastating fallout came within the first three hours of the attack when three of the city's 
finest officers drove to their death trying to secure Kama Hospital. Rakesh Maria from the Mumbai police ran the control room during the siege and now heads the investigations into the attacks. The captured terrorist Kasab is his chief lead. Kasab reveals he's from Faridkot in Pakistan. Like him, 500 young men were recruited by the internationally banned terror outfit Lashkar e Taiba, an Al Qaeda ally. After 18 months of commando training at various Lashkar camps across Pakistan, 10 men were shortlisted to carry out the attacks. Maria compiles an 11,000 page case report charging Kasab with 166 counts of murder. 35 Lashkar operatives in Pakistan are also named accessories. This is the hanglers, the, the real perpetrators of the crime are in Pakistan, on foreign soil. They are the people who are talibanizing, indoctrinating innocent uh, youth. Till they are stopped, this thing is not going to end. You are going to get one crop after uh, another. The Pakistan government admits for the first time that the attack was planned and launched from its territory. We have now two portions of this investigation. One is in India and one is in Pakistan. Crime to the criminal relates to the incident which has happened in India. Some part of the conspiracy has taken place in Pakistan and all those according to the available information, most of them, they are in our custody. Pakistan denies official involvement in the attack, but they present a dossier to India with details of the outlawed terror group Lashkar's plan. Some Lashkar observers believe that the Pakistani Inter-Services Intelligence or ISI may have ghost-directed the attack through Lashkar's operational commander Zaki Urehman Lakhvi. The difference which we make between state actors and non-state actors actually get diffused if you look at a guy like Lakhvi. And Lakhvi was handled by several of the guys in the ISI who are even now present but retired. In, even in Pakistan there is a saying that you know, there is an ISI within ISI. This uh, group, which I call it the Shadow ISI and the Shadow I Army, which uh, at the moment exists in Pakistan and which is not accountable to anybody. The Prime Ministers of Pakistan and India meet at an international summit in Egypt. But behind the handshakes, the relationship has been further strained. Clearly, they had expected India to respond very quickly uh, against Pakistan in a military sense, and that would then put uh, to rest any American speculation that Pakistan was not facing an Indian military threat, and Pakistan would therefore be able to justify its uh, troop levels on the Indo-Pak border and not extricate its troops to fulfill the American agenda of battling the Taliban, Al-Qaeda and other terror groups on the Pak Afghan border. Military analysts feel 2611 was designed by its conspirators to bring two nuclear states with a history of conflict to the brink of war. Mumbai bears the brunt, but the city is ramping up its defenses. It now has its own NSG base, just like three other Indian cities, to speed up response to future attacks. The city police is revising its standard procedures in crisis and has a $26.4 million modernization plan that includes new weapons and equipment. The train terminus limps back to normalcy just a few hours after it is attacked. The Trident Hotel and the Taj Tower Wing reopen after a month. Leopold Cafe is bustling again four days after it was attacked. The owner keeps the bullet marks in memoriam. Uh, in the end, when we open, we try to show it to the world that it is we who are more successful than the terrorists.
Let us show to the world that you know, like terrorists cannot overtake um, us, and uh, we cannot be bogged down by terrorists. But Nafisa Qureshi still can't forget the night her daughter died. मेरे दिल में अभी तक वो डर और खौफ मतलब निकला नहीं मेरे और मैं मतलब बहुत से ऐसा मेरे को बार बार मतलब वही नजारा मेरे को याद आता जब मतलब टीवी पे कोई देखती आसा ऐसा कि यहाँ फायरिंग चल रही है यहाँ बम पड़ गया ऐसा ऐसा तो मेरे को वही बेटी का नजारा याद आता बस The dark days in Mumbai have had a lasting impact on John Fesco. And when you go through an experience like this where you almost die at least twice, maybe three times, you really appreciate how limited your time is here. And, uh, and, you, and you're forced to appreciate life in, in much greater depth. Terrorists killed people indiscriminately, but the Mumbai terror attack strengthened India's resolve to fight terror. No country is safe.